I once interviewed Margaret Thatcher and asked her about her reputation for handbagging people. What do you mean, handbagging, she cried. Do you mean giving as good as you get? Well, they deserve it. There was a pause. I moved on to the next question, but suddenly she was back again. Does it mean giving them better than you got? Well, they deserve that too. She and the American President Ronald Reagan may have been soulmates, but when the US Army decided that it wanted to buy French rather than British equipment, she had no hesitation in handbagging him long distance. He was in the middle of a cabinet meeting. He held out the receiver so that everybody else could hear it, saying, what a woman. <laughs> she wasn't, of course, expected to reach number 10. Um, Ben's great uncle, the Tory MP Sir Gerald Nabarro, wrote in 1973, she is not prime ministerial material. But I suppose conceivably she might find her way into the treasury if a pri brave enough prime minister could be found to make her chancellor of the exchequer. Well, she couldn't see an institution without handbagging it when she came to power in 1979. And as those of us who were there, and most of you weren't, will remember there were an inordinate number of British institutions that needed the Thatcher treatment. The state was all pervasive, ran everything from coal mines, harbours, the railways, shipyards, steel plants, water, uh, school, the water boards, the prisons, the telephones. Inflation was up. Neither Tory nor Labour governments had been able to get it out of double figures. Taxes were sky high. None of this restrained stuff today about should the rich be paying 45p or 50p. Taxes were up at 83p, and for investors, it was 98p. No wonder there was a dearth of entrepreneurs. Public morale had collapsed. At home and abroad, many saw Britain, as we've heard, as being ungovernable. We were called the sick man of Europe. As her far from Tory biographer John Campbell said, dealing with this whole culture was necessary and long overdue. She gave ordinary people choice by opening up markets, introducing competition. The old nationalized industry certainly didn't believe in either. Think again of the choice you have today with your phones. It wasn't just that we didn't have mobiles in those days or that you had to have a black one and buy it from BT. It took months to actually get a landline installed. As one commentator has said, people wanted the freedom to spend their money as they chose and they didn't want a big state getting in the way of that liberation by suffocating people in uniformity in the drabness and dullness of state monopoly. She saved Britain from the drabness and dullness of state monopoly. The words of one of her keenest disciples, Tony Blair. Uh, Ken Livingstone, I think, who's sadly not with us tonight, I think it was him who described Blair as the, the bastard child of Thatcherism. And what was Labour doing during this period of strikes and industrial decline? Well, they were giving us nuclear-free zones in Lambeth. And they were leaving areas like L London's docklands to rot. The Labour chief whip, Bob Mellish, the then chief whip, actually joined the Docklands board. He'd been trying to get something done about Docklands since the 1960s. And he couldn't get his support party to support him. And down the road from Docklands, we've heard about what she did in the city, but what she did was to handbag the men in bowler hats and public school ties and the closed elite world of the city with their endless lunches. It was as riddled with restrictive practices as the unions. And with Big Bang, she swept that world away and enabled the city to become the greatest financial center in the world. Now we've heard some people say, that she laid the foundations for the great crash of 2008. Well, it's a, a standard propaganda technique to propagate a lie so emphatically and so frequently that people start to accept it as a fact. 
But it's risible to claim that the great crash stemmed directly from her reforms of the city more than 20 years before. And when it comes to the greed and recklessness of latter-day bankers, the real responsibility lies with Ed Balls, who boasted that he was in the Treasury and he then designed the light-touch regime of the city. And his boss, Gordon Brown, who arranged knighthoods for rogues like Fred the Shred. Another myth is that she set out to bear down on ordinary people to destroy the welfare state. In fact, national health spending rose from 4.7% to 6% of GDP. Education spending rose by 50%. And after Labour's brutal cuts in, the, in 1976-7, only 12% of school leavers were going to university. By the time she left office, it had gone up to one in three. She herself, of course, was uh, here at Oxford University, but she used to say that it never, she never let it hold her back. <laughs> she transformed Britain's reputation and standing in the world. As she said after victory in the Falklands, we have ceased to be a nation in retreat. We have instead a newfound confidence born in the economic battles at home and tested and found true 8,000 miles away. There's a story of a man walking up Whitehall who asked the policeman which side the Foreign Office was on and was told, our side, I hope so. Well, Thatcher thought they were on the side of the foreigners. She was talking about Foreign Office civil servants once and she remarked, when I retire, I'm going to set up a business called Rent-A-Spine. The first time she met Russia's Mikhail Gorbachev, she asked through the interpreters, sir, can we be absolutely frank with each other? Of course, he said. Good, she said, because I want you to know that I hate communism. <laughs> The Foreign Office officials were horrified. Gorbachev fell in love with her on the spot. Eventually, she was instrumental with Ronald Reagan in bringing about the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the peoples of Eastern Europe and Russia loved her for it. A few years ago, the British ambassador in Moscow said that Putin's people would never allow her to go to a private um, meeting in Moscow because she was so popular that if she'd have been mobbed from the moment she got off the plane. And she always received rapturous uh, welcomes when she went abroad. I was once part of the media entourage that went with her to Israel. We used to fly in a, a VC-10. It was known as the Queen Mother of the Skies because it was very graceful, very old, and full of gin. And when we arrived in Jerusalem, Loads and loads of ordinary people gathered outside the King David ho Hotel to cheer her. And they cheered her because they admired her as a conviction politician. Admittedly, she overdid the co conviction bit towards the end, started to morph into a certain bloody-mindedness, but by then she had made Britain governable again. And let's face it, this House is never going to debate whether Tony Blair or John Major or Callaghan or Wilson saved Britain, even the great Clem, Clem Attlee, who transformed the country, didn't save it. And yet, some of you, you might abhor the Tory party, but would any of you really want to return to the 1970s, when the state's power was at an all-time high and Britain's reputation in the world was at an all-time low and you couldn't go to work because of strikes? There's only, would you really prefer to go back to a time before Thatcher? There's only one honest answer to that. No, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, so that's